thank you everybody. Welcome, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, um, good middle of the night, depending on what part of the world you're dialing in on. Thanks for joining us for CPR, for CRM, to talk about some of the struggles, some of the real struggles people have with um, CRM. And, and although this says dynamic CRM, uh, we have actually helped organizations with more than dynamics. And what I can tell you is the struggle is real for everybody, not just Dynamics users. CRM can be a challenging application to get people to use. And now more than ever, we seem to be getting approached by business who, is, who are saying, um, maybe we've been trying this with limited success. Maybe we haven't even gotten on board yet, but all of a sudden now it's more important than ever that we have visibility into what each other is doing and the ability to manage our teams and ourselves and work together when we can't be together. And CRM is really emerging as one of those tools that it's really, really critical for businesses to get the adoption they're looking for in it. So great topic for today. Glad you guys are joining us. Let's jump right in. Um, first of all, one thing to know is if you are, and by the way, Lori, let me ask a question. Um, do you have the polls queued up that I'd sent over? That's a great question, Jeff. I... Uh, yes, I do. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, I, I know it's crazy time, so I just wanted to validate. Yeah. I should have done that beforehand. So I'll bring it up in just a second. But, but um, just so you know, um, you are not alone if you are struggling with CRM. Uh, one statistical um, survey after another over many, many years has found that uh, the the failure rates or high levels of struggle. Uh, are more typical than not. So let me ask something just to kind of get you guys uh, to know a little bit more about you guys as the audience today. Lori, if you would pull up the first poll and I'll kind of talk for a minute while people are doing that. If you guys would just answer this and let me know, what is your situation regarding CRM now? Are you just starting out and you just, you're here because you want to get it right? You have some small struggles, but you're doing okay overall. Um, do you feel like you're off the rails, wondering can this even be saved? Or are you well established, you've got a good foundation, but you're doing some planning, you want to improve, and so you're here to learn a little bit more about best practices. So while you vote on that, let me also share with you one of the other stats that are on the underlying page, and that is that Although a lot of these struggle and fail, one statistic that very few people talk about is that 47% of these projects on average fail two or more times before organizations either give up completely or finally get it right. Um, and it goes back to a story with one of our clients. Many years ago, they approached us. They had failed three times. Um, they're a global organization. They failed three times in the United States or North American region. And they brought us in to help and they said, look, the folks in Europe are saying they have adoption and it's going extremely well and it's a success. So let's start by talking to them. So part of the same global organization, just the EMEA part of that, or the EU, sorry, part of that organization. And so we talked to them and they said, yeah, we have 100% adoption. And we said, well, how did you do that? And they said, well, we changed our accounting, our ERP system. So you cannot create a new account there you have to go to CRM to create the new account. Great, so, so everyone's creating their new accounts in CRM. That's right. What else are they doing in CRM? Silence. And so as we dug into that a little bit more, we realized they were counting as success, just this idea that it was kind of an expensive way to create new records inside of ERP. And yes, they had people adopted and on board and knew about CRM, but they were generating no new value as a result of having done that. So, um, so I would submit to you that some of these failure statistics are probably lower than they actually appear to be because depending on who you ask, success looks very different. But if you asked a head of sales in that organization, I don't think they would have agreed with that assessment. So Lori, can you bring up the uh, poll? I will do, we'll close it now. And thanks all for voting, we'll share those out. And Jeff, we're looking at about 30%. Can you see the screen, Jeff, or no? I cannot, so it'd be great if you'd review okay. it. Okay, yeah, for sure. 30% um, starting, we want to get it right. 50% small struggles. And um, the remaining 20% at um, the last solid foundation looking to improve. Okay, great, good. So we have some people here beginning and some people with some little struggles. So good, hopefully we're gonna help you guys get a little bit more back on track with those things. 
And by the way, throughout today's presentation, you're gonna see uh, links to different resources you can go uh, grab. Feel free to grab those links, go look them up while I'm here if you want to, but I'm also going to give you the ability to get all of those resources all at once at the end of the session. So if it goes by too quick, or if you wanna stay focused on the session and then just get all the links at once, um, don't worry, you'll get an opportunity to do that. So a lot of organizations, when they start seeing, boy, we're struggling with adoption, we're struggling with ROI, we're struggling to get CRM right, these are the things they focus on. How do we add better functionality? How do we get our leaders to buy in? How do we drive up adoption overall? All of those are, are good things, but none of those are the end game. And this is where a lot of people really get off the rails. They start focusing, focusing, focusing on doing these things and making these things happen. And even great user adoption does not necessarily mean you've got a CRM that's transforming your organization. One organization we, we did some work for after we did some initial um, surveys and assessment and engagement with them, we found they were using their CRM solution well. It was not Dynamics, it was a different one. Um, and, and as we dug deeper, we found out that, um, that it was essentially destroying productivity. And one of the things we found with that organization is they had a, a very compliant uh, culture. People wanted to do what they were asked to do, so they did exactly that. But unfortunately, they would sometimes do the thing they were asked to do, even though it wasn't the right thing to do. So that's not what it's all about. There's something more to this whole CRM thing than that. And that's what I really want us to focus on today is what is it that we're really trying to do? How do we make that happen effectively? So quick introduction to me. Um, my name is Jeff Abels. I've run a, a digital workplace project, uh, a company for many, many years now, since about 2002, focusing heavily on CRM, but also things like Office 365 for internal di digital engagement too, because those things are really complementary. So over on the left side, that's kind of the geeky business side of me. Love what I do, I'm very passionate about it. I tend to spend a lot more hours doing work stuff than a lot of people do because I generally have fun with it, whether it's a very technical implementation side or whether it's coaching a sales manager on how to run sales meetings better using, um, using the tools they have available to them. Over on the right side is a little bit more about me on the personal side. My wife and I are recent empty nesters, so some of our favorite hobbies are um, having great wine together, traveling to get it. We're not doing that too much lately. Um, but maybe we're enjoying a little more wine lately and riding our motorcycle together. We uh, try not to do both of those at the same time. We're also empty nesters because our two grown daughters uh, moved out of the house. And as of a couple or three years ago, they're both married. So we're loving uh, getting to know our sons-in-law more and having boys in the family and spending time with family. But to fill our empty nest, we recently about a year ago adopted Verdi. This is our mixed, Chihuahua slash Pitbull. I'm told that was a very ambitious Chihuahua. Uh, and the second picture of her is her sitting next to me where she is right now in my home office, um, keeping me company during the COVID crisis. So her and I are office mates now. And then the most recent and most exciting bit of news for us is we recently became grandparents. So we're very excited about that. Meet Theodore Evergreen Tramolini, who was born just over a month ago. Um, so that's that's kind of the personal side of me. I like people to get to know both sides and I like to get both to know both sides of the people that I'm engaged with. So let me ask you three more quick questions to get to know you a little bit more. Lori, if you would bring up poll number two and um, I'm gonna ask you guys to let me know how is this whole COVID thing impacting your work right now? Is it Are you actually finding yourself more productive, less productive or about the same? Just take a couple seconds and give me that feedback. All right, great. And thank you all. I'll go ahead and close that out and share the results with you. Here's where we sit. We got 40% more productive. I, I sometimes feel like I am in that category as well. 20% less productive and about the same for 40%. Cool. Let's bring up the next one and ask, what about your CRM project? How has COVID impacted that? Has it become more urgent? Is it about the same? Um, is, it, is it actually less urgent now because you've got other things that have become higher priorities? So four options to choose from, pick the one that applies to you the most. And we have about 50% of our audience that's voted. There it goes up. Thank you all and we'll close it and share. 22% a bit more urgent. 67 is our majority, at, or 67% it's about the same and 11% it's less urgent, okay. Jeff. 
so slightly skewed to the more urgent side. And then last, last poll question, I promise, hope everybody will participate. Tell me what you're doing more of as a result of COVID. And you can check, I believe this one's set up, so you can check multiple items. So, you know, on the fun side, you streaming video and playing video games. Are you getting together with people more? I know I actually am getting together with old friends for some reason more often via Zoom than I have in many years, and that's been fun. Uh, are you sharing memes? Are you going outside more? Um, or are you working more? Or some combination of all of those things? All right, great. Couple more seconds, and thank you all. We'll share those out. 14% streaming video, 43% getting together virtually. Great. And then 43% uh, working. Okay. All right. So maybe all around good stuff with a little less commute time. Maybe we're being more productive with work and helping our coworkers to get back online. So um, to stay productive, I mean. So, so. Um, one of the questions we asked in some of the surveys we've done is how many times have you implemented CRM? This is where we kind of came up with a statistic that 47% have failed two or more times. But as we dug into this question a little bit, one of the things we realized many years ago was we were going down the path of some really bad assumptions with this. We, in fact, we put a whole marketing plan together many years ago called targeting the second timers. And what we thought was, hey, after the first time, you've learned all the hard lessons and you're gonna get it right more often the second time. And we also assumed that it's just because the technology had not been set up correctly for you. Not that the technology itself is bad, but maybe it hadn't been configured and set up correctly. And while that might be a part of the issue, what this question and some of the underlying research told us is by and large, technology is not the reason why CRM projects struggle and fail and better technology, even better configuration of the technology is ultimately not going to be the solution. We did some work not long ago for an organization that had set up their own homegrown CRM solution on top of Lotus Notes. If you don't know what Lotus Notes is, ask your mom or dad, because that's what people were using as their email and business automation solution back in the 90s. And yes, it is still around for some companies now, this company recently had that up and running and they were running circles with CRM. They were doing a great job. Adoption was super high. Managers were getting valuable reports out of it. Users were getting value out of what they did. Now, you can't tell me that a Lotus Notes solution is configured better than a dynamic solution or some other leading edge CRM solution. They had great success, not because they had great technology, but because something else was working for them. And I would submit to you that most of the organizations out there that are having some struggles or using a tool like Dynamics are not struggling because, predominantly because of the technology, it's because something else is going on. Now, don't mishear that. There's always opportunities to clean things up, do things a little tighter, um, improve the, the efficiency and speed of processes and that kind of stuff. Configuration is something you always wanna focus on. But I would tell you 95 times out of 100 in our experience, that is tertiary at best. It's usually something else further behind um, that's, that's causing that problem. So let me ask you a rhetorical question. Do you think that if you change how you exercise and how you eat and how the quality of your sleep and how you meditate, do you think that would have a transformative impact on your entire life? And of course, when I ask this question live, everybody in the audience is shaking their heads, yes, or, or raising their hands. And then the follow-up question is this, how satisfied are you that you are doing all those things as well as you would like to, right? Almost all of us would say, yeah, you know what? I, I really could do a better job with exercise. I really could get a little more sleep at night. My diet could be improved a little bit, um, maybe drastically. Um, I'm certainly there with some of those categories myself. So the reality is we know the right things to do and we know we're not covering those gaps, right? And we'd go out and buy something like a Fitbit and think, this is great. This is gonna change my behavior. It's gonna tell me what I'm, what I'm doing right and what I'm doing wrong. It's gonna give me metrics that will change what I'm doing. But look, getting a membership to a gym does not make you a fit person. You've gotta go use the membership. You've gotta to listen to what the Fitbit is doing. CRM is just a gym membership. It's just a Fitbit. It's only as good as how you actually use it to improve what you're doing, right? So that's really where the heart of this thing is. It's easy to kind of check the boxes saying it's configured well, we've got the right tool, but are we using it and are we using it in the right way? 
So as we looked at this and looked at this, we ultimately came up with what we call the seven deadly sins of CRM projects. And we continue to refine this a little bit over time. But what is the core problem here? I could read through all of these and go into a lot of detail about each of them. And I am gonna come back into this a little bit. But if I were to look at this at a very high level, here's what we have found consistently to be the problem. It's really along two core areas with a third one that might be a little bit on the technical side. And one is a lot of CRM projects lack the planning that's required to do them well. And planning falls across a lot of strategic dimensions. There's the overall vision for where is this going? We're getting on this boat and sailing away. What are we going to? How will we know when we get there? There's a project management type of planning. It's how, exactly how are we going to execute this project? What's the right agile versus waterfall type of approach? How do we keep improving things? And what are we trying to actually improve in the life of the people that this tool exists to serve? The frontline people who are caring for our customers in sales, marketing, customer care, and the management teams over the top of them. Are we improving things for them? So all of that goes into planning. And the second piece is the controls that are in place to keep it from getting out of scope, to make sure that we're communicating well and managing change. Look, people, do not like the change by and large. And most companies don't do nearly enough to think about what we broadly categorize as change management. They throw a little bit of training out there and that's the change management plan. If you wanna change and change well, it requires a lot more than just a little bit of training on something you've thrown out there for everybody. The project controls need to be in place too so that scope doesn't creep, you don't get sideways with exactly what you're doing. And there needs to be an expectation that this is not a piece of hardware that we build and then we're done and we walk away and move on to the next project. It has to be continuously improved. Nothing change, changes faster than the people we exist to serve, our customers, our prospects. And nothing in the organizations changes faster than the people who have to face those people every single day. So you need a plan and an approach and a process for doing that. And then the one area that's not highlighted in our planning and control is integration. And that's somewhat of a technical issue. You need that to be done technically right for it to work. But when people are just using CRM as another system and having to go to a lot of other places plus CRM to get their jobs done, that almost 100% of the time results in failure. Now that doesn't mean if you're just starting, you need that in phase one, but if it's not on your roadmap and relatively early within the first couple of years of beginning to roll this thing out on your roadmap, you're gonna falter and struggle to stay ahead. So all those seven things boil down to three overall. So the way we like to look at this is to, is to develop a framework and say, so, so who is this about and what do we do about this? One of the things we found over time is, first of all, you've got to think about all your stakeholders when you think about CRM. So we like acronyms, so we call this CUBS is the easy way to remember this. Your customers, right? It is CRM, right? It's customer relationship management. I can tell you when we think about all the stakeholders out there, the one that most frequently gets forgotten or not addressed at all when you're laying out your CRM strategy and solution is your customers. How is this making things better for them? How is it creating a better process that they can work with you on? Then your users, your frontline users, but we like to also think of your users as your managers also. So most organizations think of users as kind of the, the rep, right? The sales rep, the customer care rep, the marketing person who's using the system to get their daily job done. But we think of users also as managers and even the executives over all of the business as target users for this. Too often those other two strata are left behind and if executives and managers aren't buying in and being transformed by CRM, your users will not be transformed by using CRM either. When we put business out there, what we really mean is the ROI. The business exists to make a profit. The business exists to provide a product or a service to a customer and to do that efficiently and with excellence and to improve in all those areas. CRM has to serve that bottom line as well. And then lastly, but not leastly, is how, are, how is your organization bringing in your technology group, your systems as a stakeholder too? Now, in our experience, that is not the group that should be running the project. That is not the group that should be controlling the budget for the project. 
that group is somebody in the users and business group, right? That's somebody who says, this is my solution to help run my team better. It's not IT solution to run IT better, but IT needs to partner with them well to get it done. And they need to bring the right resources to the table to be able to do the technical things that need to get done with excellence. So that's kind of one part of the framework. You need to think through all four of those core stakeholder groups. The other part of the framework is this. It's something that came to us after many, many years of doing research where we found there are five core areas that organizations that do well with CRM take really seriously. And they look at CRM as a tool to help them do those five things better. In fact, it goes all the way down to their business philosophy, not just tactics, but what they do and why they do it. And those five things are, CRM needs to help them listen better, right? And listening when you do it at a corporate level, that's data. That means everybody's listening to the customer and they're putting things into this common mind, this common brain called CRM. The second thing is they wanna understand the customer. So the data is there, how do we analyze it? How do we do research? How do we pull the right statistics? How do we constantly find new, better ways to engage? How do we find more relevant things to do with our customers? How do we really understand them and each other? The third thing is they connect. Now that we have that data and we've done some research to make better decisions with it, how do we actually put processes in place to connect with our customers? So connecting, in real life looks like good habits, right? It's things that the best connectors do over and over again. Habits in the corporate world, those are called processes. So how are we actually automating and putting processes in place that allow flexibility to be fully human, but enough rigidity to do things in a certain way that we can drive productivity and efficiency and insight throughout the process. The fourth area is they're continuously improving. They know what their results are and they never feel like they've arrived. They constantly say, how do I look at this differently? My customer's changing or maybe they're not, but there's new innovative ways to approach my customer. And if I don't use my CRM tool to help discover those things, my competitors are going to do that. So how does this become a continuous improvement and innovation tool? So those four things are things you do. Listen, understand, connect, and know. That's an acronym, it stands for luck. Then the fifth thing is what we call good luck because good luck isn't what you do, it's why you do it, it's who you are, it's your purpose. And the best companies in the world look at this as a way of saying, our culture is about people. And CRM helps us live out those cultural values better than we could without it. So those, that's the other part of the framework. We talked about Cubs, now we talk about this idea of the luck principle. And what we have found is companies that do those five things well, tend to do CRM really, really well. They automatically know um, how and why to do what it is that they're doing. So we're trying to constantly embrace those principles too and get those in front of our customers. So we call organizations that do that powered by luck and we say that's our mission, to help you become powered by luck. So I hope when you leave today, you'll be a little more powered by luck yourself. So bringing those two things together, remember our stakeholders, CUBs, customers, users, business and systems, and powered by luck, listening, understanding, connecting, knowing, and good luck. Over many, many years, we've looked at all those things and have developed and continue to develop tools and approaches to help people be more successful with their projects based on the intersection of those two frameworks. So you can see here's a huge list of things. It's a partial list, but a huge list of things that we found are really helpful tools to help drive success, drive ROI, drive productivity, and ultimately to also drive adoption. Today, we don't have time to cover all of those. So I've selected the top eight, um, and I'm gonna go through as many of them as I possibly can in the 32 minutes that I have remaining to help impart what those are. We can dive a lot deeper, and I'm gonna give you lots of tools to dive deeper, but I'm gonna go through them pretty quickly to give you the most important ones we found out there. There are many others, and I'm happy to talk to you about those separately if that's of interest to you. So the very first and foremost, Find your why, what is your vision? Why are you doing this project? Why is it important to an individual user? Why is it important to a manager? Why is it important to your company? Why is it important to your customers? Why is it important to your IT group? Keep asking why. Most people, when I start to talk about this, I kind of get a glazed over look in the sense of, yeah, we've done that well enough and we're ready to move on to something else. Or even we get that that's important, but I don't need to talk about it because I already know that that's important. I can tell you in very, very few cases have 
the organizations that come to us asking for help, and by the way, over 70% of our customers are people who come to us and say, we've got it, but we need help with some part of it. And, and virtually all of them have not done a good enough job of understanding and defining their why and communicating their why to everybody in the organization. Look, here's the reality. If you have a user who doesn't believe that they need to use CRM, they don't understand why it's important for them, why it's important to the business, you can throw all sorts of training and incentives at them and never change your behavior. But if you have a user that says, I absolutely believe with passion in my heart that this is an important thing for me to be doing to be successful and to make my business successful, you better get out of their way because you don't even need to train them. They're gonna be going after it to make themselves more successful and productive with the tool. Now, I'm not saying it's a silver bullet. There are certain people who are gonna hold out no matter what you do, but CRM is a numbers game. You've gotta push all the right buttons for all the right users to get to the success level you need. And you're gonna push the most buttons the fastest by getting your hands clearly around this idea of why. So how do you define your why? Let me give you a couple of tools. First of all, here's a great guy that I admire, one of the greatest business consultants and business prophets of the 20th century, Peter Drucker. And here's what he said. Look, there's only one real purpose for any business to create and keep a customer, right? So what's the most important application in your business? Well, probably the ones that help you to create and keep a customer, right? That's not the case for many, many businesses. But if you look at this and say, yes, this is, at a very high level, we're gonna all be unique. We're not gonna say exactly what Peter Drucker said, but how can we use this as a starting point to say this helps to define why CRM is going to be important to us. Then you also engage with your users, right? You ask them why. So here's a really simple exercise you can do. You can take, I'm gonna talk about a physical one, but there's actually uh, digital tools you can do this with. If I don't mention it, ask me again at the end of the session or send me an email, whatever, and I'll, and I'll let you know what those are. But the way we typically facilitate this is we would say, look, here's a list of all the personas in our organization. And you can start with just customers, users, business, and systems if you want to start with that. Those are kind of header sticky stickies on the wall. If you want to get more specific, you can say leaders, managers, inside sales, outside sales, marketing users, customer care, however you want to break this down. But you put those stickies across the top of the wall and then you say, okay, gang, I want each one of you to write down at least three reasons why CRM can or should be important to these people. And you don't wanna ask it as based on what it does for you right now, but if something really helped you connect better with the customers and serve them better, why would that be important to you? What would it do that would make that important to you? And you start to get a whole group of people brainstorming the why together. Now, not only does that give you a sense of the why, but it gets them to buy into the why too. If it's you telling them why as the parent, they're not gonna accept it as fast as them actually coming up with a why. And by the way, one of the great bottom line whys for uh, customer relationship management systems is right at the top of this slide. If you look at, well, we wanna listen to people better, <clears throat> understand them better, connect with them in a more productive and efficient and relevant way, know our results so we can continuously improve and live out our mission to be customer centric, that's your why, right? I'm not saying adopt that exactly. <clears throat> And I'm not saying adopt Peter Drucker exactly, but what I am saying is you've got to get that sense of why. If you haven't done that yet, I beg of you, please do it. If you take one thing away from you today, define that why. And by the way, the other thing to do with why is to then build that into your communications program. We call them communications programs instead of training. You can also call them learning and development if you want. But we call them that because part of the process of getting people to adopt and use and get value out of your CRM investment is to get them to understand the why. And marketers will tell you, the average person has to hear your message somewhere between seven and 21 times before it begins to register with them. So you can't just define the why once and answer it and it's done. You need to expect to continue to answer it again and again and again throughout the life cycle of your project. I've been in meetings where in the morning it is a super well articulated why, and after lunch, a couple of people start going, well, why do we need to use this again? And it can be frustrating. You think, didn't we just answer that question? But people need to hear it again and again. It takes time to get it beyond the surface layer, deep into the heart of the people that you exist to serve and provide this service to. So next up, let's see if my clicker is gonna work here. Next up is focusing on the fundamentals. 
So activities are actually at the heart of CRM. And I see many people actually ignore using activities or properly driving activity management home to their folks. Look, most people say, oh, CRM is, an acti is a customer a centered system and everything in there centers around the customer, whether that's an account or a contact or some combination of those two things. That is true. But if you look closely at CRM operationally, you'll also see CRM is an activity centric system too. All those activities you can create in CRM, they can be linked to all those other important records in CRM. Why is that? because you need one place to get stuff done. If you have five places to go to figure out what your activity list looks like, you are out of control, literally. You have no way of understanding your full workload, prioritizing it, and managing it well. There's a link to a blog there with more information. Again, I'll give you access to all the links later. So one way we like to approach this is just starting to ask this question overall. Why should you manage activities? And I crossed out in CRM there, uh, particularly, in, specifically um, because a lot of times we find as users of CRM, people have become very comfortable being reactive. And so we wanna say, forget CRM, let's just talk about activity management in general. Why is it important that we do that? And then start to say, now how can CRM take that even further? How can that help us to do even more? This is so important that we put together an ebook specifically on this topic. We do sessions at Summit and webinars specifically on what exactly are we talking about? Why is activity so important? And what do we need to be able to do with to be able to do with that? This ebook has all the reasons why for activity management. Remember, I said why is important. Why activity management is also important. So be thinking about how do I get my users to actually do activity management in CRM. By the way, here's one. Here's two whys. The first one that, that's most obvious to me is what I said earlier. You've got to be able to be proactive and manage your own workload. If you're not managing your activities, you have resigned control of your life, control of your customers. You are no longer able to be proactive. You're just reacting to the situation to get on top of things. You wanna manage activities to be proactive. Why manage activities in CRM? One key benefit that is often lost on people is if you take a close look at all the AI offerings coming out from Microsoft now, a lot of the AI that has surfaced through that is a result of good activity management. It's looking at the cadence of your activities, how many times you've connected with people during an opportunity to rate an opportunity, red, green, or yellow, the kind of notes you're taking so it can predict what activities you might need to do next to ensure you're doing follow-up well. If those activities are not in CRM, AI is not gonna do any good for you whatsoever. If half your users are doing them and half of them aren't, you might get some value, but the more statistical significance you have with information inside of your CRM application, the more valuable AI is gonna be able to contribute to your bottom line. We're only at the dawn of that, it's gonna get better and better. Okay, next up, rate your CRM. So take a look at your CRM and say, how are we really doing? What we see a lot of organizations doing is chasing the squeaky wheel, right? Whoever's complaining the loudest and most frequently gets all the attention, but that might not be what your CRM actually needs. So why rate your CRM? Why do benchmarking? Really simple, because people are gonna support what they help to create, right? So this is a great way to listen to your team and say, what is it that's important to you? What is it that you're struggling with? And how can we do priorities in such a way that we're gonna take care of the most important thing, what we call the biggest gaps, and I'll explain that in a second, first. So what does a survey look like? How do you actually get feedback from uh, your team? So we've put together another ebook here. Here, I'll bring up the link to that one. Uh, we've put together another ebook here called Rate Your CRM, and it talks about how to do this. First of all, it talks about a participant profile, right? That's so you can segment your users based on the business division they're in, their working style, um, age, all of those different things. Now, it should be um, uh, anonymous, right? So you're not interested in looking at individuals, you're looking, interested in looking at groups and how to serve them. Then you ask them to prioritize how important are different things that CRM might be able to do to you. And by the way, you can do these surveys before you even launch a CRM tool. If you phrase this up correctly, you don't go, 
hey, how important is it that Dynamics be able to do this for you? It's how important is it that you be able to do X, right? How important is it to you that you be able to manage your activities? How important is it to you that you be able to easily access the list of everything going on with customers? We don't care if it's being done in Dynamics or not. All we care about is how important is this thing to you? And then you say, how satisfied are you with your ability to get that thing done, right? So what you do ultimately between those two things is you create a gap. Again, remember I said some of the organizations out there spend all their time trying to solve the squeaky wheel problem, but that might actually be something people are really unsatisfied with. But if you ask how important it is to them, you might find out it's not really that important to them at all. Whereas something else that's really important to people and they're a little more satisfied with, but not very satisfied with, would create a huge difference for you. So you look at that big gap, that big difference between priority and satisfaction, and you solve the biggest gaps first. Now you can also look at gap in terms of um, effort and ease of use to do certain things as well. And that's in the ebook. The last thing that's actually not in that ebook is something we've only started doing in the last year or two here. And we've actually found that it is absolutely a game changer. Um, we call it a cultural analysis. And it's some very weird questions that we ask, but what we have found is there's, there's a body of research that has been built over tens of thousands of surveys over a 30 plus year period with absolutely concrete evidence that shows what the role is in different cultures in adopting different things and transforming their behavior. So this cultural analysis, we look at about six different things within it. Most of the stuff that's out there that we research is actually fairly public. We've of course done some of our own proprietary stuff with it. But for instance, we found organizations where we say, you have an incredible level of horizontal trust, very high off the charts. Horizontal trust means between and across business units, people tend to trust each other. They tend to do handoffs really well. They take things at face value, they work together well. But you have a horrible level of absorptivity or elasticity, two of the other metrics we look at. So although people trust each other well, you don't change well. When you hear some outside thing, especially if it doesn't plug well into your natural process already, you really, really resist it. So what do you do when you understand that cultural analysis? You say, let's find that group that has the best absorptivity, the most likely group to change, and let's start with them. And then let's leverage this fact that we've got great horizontal trust to then bloom out from there into the other groups. Now, every company is different. That was one company. Your company might be the opposite. Understanding your culture will absolutely be able to change your strategy for how you get people to use your CRM solution at a very tactical level and also at a strategic level. So the way to do this, by the way, is it's not a one-time survey. We call it a benchmark for a reason. Ideally, you do this at least yearly, probably not much more than yearly. We've done it a couple times a year for some organizations. You take the input, you make decisions, you tell people what you've heard, you prioritize accordingly, then you do it again a year from then. And you ask the same questions or mostly the same questions because one of the problems with CRM is it's kind of a pass fail class. And what I mean by that is if it's working well, no one's parading you around the office on their shoulders saying hooray for the CRM team that implemented CRM for us. But if it's not working well, they're on your back, right? They're driving you crazy. And parts of it will always not be keeping up, right? They'll always be that next thing that people want. So it's easy to one year later for leadership or even you as a team that has to implement CRM to be saying, boy, people are still grumbling and complaining and this doesn't feel like we're making progress. But if you can go back to that benchmark from a year ago and say, hey, look, here are the top two priorities that we saw last year and we focused on solving those. And now we've asked the same question this year. And look, we don't need to focus on those anymore. Priority three has now become priority one. So now you can start to get a better sense of grading yourself and seeing the improvement visually because you can't always do that just based on um, subjective one-off user feedback types of things. So benchmarking is a great way to stay on top of that. And once you get into a rhythm, it's not all that time consuming to make it happen. So next up is this idea of the planning side, right? So how do we uh, be agile, do roadmaps and do annual planning? One of the things we found is this, when people kind of start a CRM project, they kind of have this vision, they might get a demo and they kind of realize, wow, we're kind of on this old fashioned way of doing things. Maybe we're using Excel spreadsheets and submitting our sales reports as Word documents and 
Customer care is using the accounting system to do their job and they should really use more customer facing type of system. And so that's really antiquated ERP solution. And so you're kind of on this old comfortable country road and you're never gonna turn that into a super highway by paving potholes. But that's the approach a lot of people take. Like if we pave enough of these potholes, people are gonna start saying that this is great. But all you've got is a really bumpy country road if you've paved potholes. You don't have a whole new way of looking at things. So what do you do to do planning? So the top of this is what paving potholes looks like. It's really kind of the functionality, right? We wanna do these three core things and maybe some things um, not related to it called XRM a little bit better. And so you kind of focus on that. But project planning comes below all of that. In fact, project planning is separate from what we would call road mapping and annual planning. So what we see is the best practice that you get the best results from is at the very beginning of a project, do a road map, get the vision. Now, most people who come to these things and most people who come to us are already into their project. So they ask, well, is it too late? No, of course not. Find out where, wherever you are, stop, get the vision, answer the why. That's the first thing to do. And then kind of go through a mini version of that annually because the technology is changing so fast, it's hard to keep up with it. And we are in a full-time job at our company of keeping up with this technology. And it is a lot of work for us to stay on top of it. Most of the clients we support have somewhere between zero and maybe two or three administrative quasi-technical people who have to stay on top of it. And they just can't, right? So you need to come back every year and say, the technology has changed. Our understanding has changed. Now that our users are doing different things, they're dreaming different dreams. Our marketplace is changing. Our customers are changing. We need an annual plan to kind of come back and not be heads down, paving potholes or following a roadmap that we wrote three years ago. The world has changed too much to do that. So an annual planning cadence to come back and do that. Depending on who you are, you should spend one to five days up front doing your roadmap. And that's kind of concentrated meetings time plus maybe several weeks putting all that together. And for your annual plan, you should spend anywhere from a half a day to two or three days per year with the team pulling the annual plan together. Again, depends on your size and complexity. Then you have your milestones, your individual project plans that sit on top of that. And you do governance and change management and adoption in real time. You need to build that in. You can't think with your annual plan about the details of each individual project plan, the details of how you're gonna do master data management and data quality and governance, and the details of how you're gonna do change management and adoption. You need to budget for those things. You need to know that those things need to happen. And then as you do each project plan, you build those items into the project plan and you have an ongoing cadence of support or the right people who are doing those things for you on an ongoing basis. So again, four types of planning. There's the upfront roadmap, there's the annual plan, there's your project plan, and then there's the things you're actually doing during the implementation. And remember, in an agile world, a project plan is not a waterfall with every single detailed requirement and all the steps you need to take over three months to do it. It's more three months of maybe monthly milestones with a little bit of uh, description and detail, a bogey for your budget, and every month from an agile standpoint, you look at that more tightly, you develop a more detailed project plan. At the end of the month, you take stock of how you've done, you improve and you move on, you move in real time. Because look, a lot of good small steps, that's gonna lead you to transformation, right? You're not gonna get there overnight, you've gotta figure out how to take small steps leading you in the right direction. And this is just a different way of saying, here's those four types of planning you need to do. And remember, in addition to implementing big new steps or new things inside of your solution, you've got to also support it. And support and implementation are two different tracks. If you have the same people being managed the same way, trying to do those two different things, you're going to struggle and fail. You're going to have scope creep. You're going to have people frustrated. It's not going to work well for you. You need to approach those two things differently. About a year ago, I did a webinar recording on this. You can go grab that off of the um, off of the 365 UG website. We're actually going to do an academy session this summer on the same topic. And remember this: I don't think this is a real picture, but big steps do lead to big mistakes. So the agile way of taking a few small steps, looking around, taking stock, fine tuning, a few more steps, a few more steps. This is the way that you need to go. You need to have that big picture vision, so you have you, you know that you're going in the right general direction. But then in the day-to-day, -day, small steps, agile, learn, improve, move on. 
The next one up here is this idea of integrating, migrating, and eliminating. Remember I said uh, the one more technical thing that we see happen often is that uh, people never integrate their systems. People have to now go to many different systems to get their jobs done. In fact, this research from um, ZDNet, at least it was in a ZDNet publication, uh, indicated that the average employee has to go to 25 different applications per week to get their job done. Research that we've done on employee satisfaction and number of systems uh, pretty strongly indicates that when you have to use CRM plus two or more systems to get your job done, it, you have about a 15% hit in job satisfaction. Now, we didn't have a big enough sample size to see if that declined the more systems you used. All we could look at is two or fewer and then three or more. Um, but there is a big significant hit right there. So we're basically dehumanizing our workforce if we don't do this, right? In fact, we start to have people saying things like this. Uh, the quote on the right here, we felt like we were marching up a mountain with a heavy backpack and management through a rock called CRMN and said, there, that should help. We see this so often where it's just another thing. It's not something that's saving anyone time. It's not something that's helping people do their jobs better. It's just another place that they have to go to put information in, in addition to all the other places they had to use before as well. And it's another place to go to get information out in addition to all the other places they had to go to before as well. So integration, absolutely critical. Think advisor and not support. So most organizations, when they think about, well, how am I going to support my CRM solution? They think I need a support person. Maybe it's a, an internal CRM administrator. Maybe it's an external partner that you have a support contract with. And make no mistake, you need help desk. You need to solve problems on a, all of those kinds of things. But what we have found is that's not the most important kind of support that you need. You really need strategic support, coaching support, communication support, training support, things that aren't typically part of a quote support agreement and things that frankly aren't very, a CRM type of administrator is not typically very good at. So here's a, here's a quick analogy for you. I'm not big into sports analogies, but I think this one fits real well. So this talks about golf and golf technology. And in golf, all this great technology has come out over the years. But in spite of all that technology that's come out, all those new clubs and all that kind of stuff, the average score for an amateur golfer, pretty much still the same as it has ever been. CRM sounds familiar to that, right? All this great new technology, all these cool new things we're doing for it, all this great technical support work that we're doing, and yet are we really changing the game or are we just kind of stirring the pot a little bit? Another way of looking at this, when, uh, when um, five PGA certified instructors got together and put together 10 steps for improving the golf, your golf game, notice what is not on that list, getting new golf clubs right? It's all about routine. It's all about practicing. It's all about coaching. And yet when most golfers, amateur golfers look at this, they say, boy, that takes a lot of time and thought. And you know what? I just want a cool new piece of technology. I want to go buy that new driver. So how much is that driver really worth? Well, look, here's our amateur golfer on the left-hand side, your weekend hacker with that average score of 100, right? They pay a little bit for lessons. They go buy a lot of new equipment every year. And the real goal is, I just want to have fun with friends. But the top PGA Tour professionals with the best scores in the world who say, I am doing this to make a living. I am doing this because my business and my life depends on it. Where do they spend their time and money? They spend it on coaches. And it's interesting because if anybody doesn't need a coach, it's a PGA Tour professional, right? They're at the top of their game. Why should They should be the ones giving out coaching. But even these ones who are at the top of the game and know more about it than almost anyone else in the world say, that's not enough. I need people who are strategically engaged with me to help me stay focused on my game, keeping it up, improving it, diligence, um, accountability, all of those kinds of things. And by the way, they tend to use their clubs literally until the grooves are worn off of the clubs. It's not about the clubs. It's about the strategy. It's about the advisory skills. So what's your goal with CRM? Is it to be a weekend hacker to help your people keep having fun with each other? Or is your goal to make it a business transformation tool? If it's the latter, you might be focusing on the wrong things by focusing on having a CRM administrator to solve technical issues and implement cool new things for you. Both of those are important. I'm not saying don't do them at all. What I am suggesting is you might be missing another more important component. 
then I think this might be your last one. Um, understand the personas who are engaged with you, right? Your user personas and your customer personas. Um, we have a couple of great tools for that. An empathy map is a way to really kind of get inside of somebody's head to really feel their pain. So if you have a group that's supporting you and saying, I want to understand somebody well enough, not only to hear them say, here's what I want, but I actually want to understand why is it that you want that? And might there be something else you need more? And I want to feel the pain of your situation in such a real tangible way that I want to solve that pain for you as much as you want to solve that pain for yourself. But for most organizations, there is this huge gap between the people who are struggling to use CRM and the people who are supporting CRM. It's very hard for those two worlds to relate to each other. Empathy mapping, understanding personas, that's one way to begin to be able to do that. That's my email address to request the worksheets, but again, I got a bigger thing for you at the end of this. And also did a webinar on this about a year ago too, called Journey and Personas. So you can go grab that webinar if you want to. Now at a high level, here's something to know about your personas. I love this quote from Douglas Adams. So he's basically like, hey, there's three types of people in the world. There's younger people who say, hey, anything uh, when you're born uh, and anything that's in the world when you're born is normal, it's ordinary, it's just a natural part of the way the world works. Then people who are a little bit more in their middle years, they say anything that's invented between when you're 15 and 35 is new and exciting and revolutionary and you can probably get a career in it. And then the people who are a little older and say, hey, anything invented after you're 35 is against the natural order of things. Doesn't that sound like the, the way your users break out, right? You need to understand you've got some people who are kind of going, I just expect this. It's been there everywhere I've ever been before. When it's there, I'm gonna use it, it makes sense. Others say this is new and exciting and I'm gonna adopt it, but it's a little intimidating, but it's, it's great. And then others who are saying, I've done this a certain way my entire career and I really don't wanna change anymore at this point. This is intimidating for me. There's a lot more subtle detail to that, but if you understand your personas and you can do some of that through your surveying, you can actually start to change the game. Then think about what are we actually doing with our processes? Are we doing things the same way we've, already, we've always done them? Or worse yet, are we doing things worse than we were before? One client that we worked with, a manufacturer out of Florida, literally as we engaged with them after they'd failed a number of times, we talked to them about, uh, things like activities and reporting. And they said, you know, come to think of it, before we started with Dynamics, we actually had this great routine weekly activity reporting, uh, activity report that people had to submit. It was very manual, but we got those and people held accountable to them. Then we got CRM and we kind of thought, well, this will be automatic. And so we stopped doing it and we're completely out of the process. We're actually doing things worse because we have a CRM tool than we were before we had a CRM tool. So are you automating, are you continuing to do what's working for you while finding ways to do other things that can work better for you? How important is this? How real is this? It's so real. Uh, here's a number of statistics, but there are a number of others across all dimensions of CRM and even just relationships in general, stating essentially that if you can do a better job with automating your processes, you're gonna actually get better results. So how do you do this? People-oriented processes, people-first processes are different from task-first processes. So one of the things you have to do is you have to think in terms of design thinking. Most organizations have the same people that design their accounting processes and their finance processes and their operations processes, design their CRM processes. Those other processes tend to be very rigid, task-first processes. People-first processes need to be more flexible. So getting the old, uh, folks who are the people who had done those legacy processes to now do these people first processes that can straight jacket your people facing people into processes that actually slow them down slow productivity result in bad decisions for customers and just don't work out very well design thinking helps you to think a little bit more outside of the box and balance some additional rigidity with some flexibility there's a rapid sales process recording talking about sales process design that you can go help yourself to. It gets a little bit more into process thinking. And then um, rethinking training. I suggested this earlier on. Uh, a couple of key thoughts on this one is this slide lists all the different ways people tend to get training on any kind of digital workplace transformation. And they're sorted in terms of how frequently those are done. So at the top of this, you can see the most frequent form of training that's delivered is classroom training. Now I've highlighted the five most effective ones based on those different color codes you see for the bars there. 
And you can see three of the best, uh, of the most effective ways to train people are the least used. They're at the very bottom of the list. And the first one you hit is number four on the list. The second one is about in the middle of the list. People learn a lot of different ways. We need to put different tools out there for them to learn. And if you're resource constrained, I understand, but you do need to focus on the ones that at least will work. And it does take time. It's better to slow down and do it right than to speed up and do it halfway. So these are some training and communication things that we work through with folks. So look, the bottom line is simply this. Your people who are using CRM, they're skilled craftsmen, right? They have a toolbox of things they need to be using. One of the most important tools in that toolbox, or really a set of the most important things, is CRM itself. They need to be lifelong learners with those tools, right? If you're a carpenter, you're constantly learning and keeping up with your tools and new tools. Your people need to be doing the same thing. So a few wrap up things and take away things for you. First of all, remember this, it is hard to change behavior and it takes a long time. There's a myth out there that says, if you do something consistently for 30 days, you formed a new habit and you can move on to the next thing. The European Journal of Social Psychology would suggest that that is not true, that the average is actually 66 days. And for some people, it's as much as 254 days before they permanently change their behavior. So you may be going a little too fast. Franklin Covey did other research that, that essentially said, don't try to change too many things at once. Don't try to have too many goals at once. Now, most people that we work with say, well, all I did was train them to use CRM. But what you really did was you said, there's a new way to do reporting. There's a new application to put information into. There's a new way to manage your Rolodex. You're gonna use it in Outlook. You're gonna use it on your mobile phone. You're gonna use it on your desktop. You start looking at all those things and all of a sudden you realize your people are struggling because they're trying to do 11 new things in new ways rather than just one or two things. So if you think you're going slow enough, you probably need to actually go slower. How can you slow down and give people time to get on board? And at the end of the day, remember your why. We're doing this because we exist to serve people and we exist to serve each other within our companies. We exist to serve customers. If we can keep that in mind as our why, and then we kind of go after that instead of losing track and saying, oh my gosh, how do we drive adoption? Oh my gosh, how do we stop people from complaining? All we're doing is addressing symptoms in that case. Get to the core. How do we help people to live out their purpose better, to live out their job description better? If we do that, we're gonna solve the, the uh, problem as well as the various different symptoms that we're seeing. So, promised you a couple things here. So here's some, um, here's some resources. Tons of upcoming webcasts. Um, these are all on um, the UG communities. You can go search for them on their site. But we've actually published a blog. So there's a link there, gotluck.link slash 2020 virtual. Um, that's just the next couple of months worth. We've got a bunch of others and these are all related to what we're talking about today. This whole idea of how do we become more effective strategically with CRM, not how do we do things um, technologically with CRM. There's other great uh, webinars on that as well. And then we're also doing four academy sessions. These are paid sessions sponsored by the user group communities um, during the summer that is all about this. So vision and road mapping, we'll do a half day on. Personas, journey mapping and design thinking, we're gonna do a half day on. Sales process design, we're gonna do a half day on. And CRM leadership and overall adoption, we're gonna do a half day on. So we'd love to have you join us for some of those sessions. There's a link there to be able to get to those as well. You'll have to search for those ones. Um, we didn't do uh, links to each individual one. But on this page, you can also see, if you will send me just an email, I will send you an email back with links to every resource that I've mentioned into this, as well as a link to all the downloadable eBooks and everything in one place. So you don't have to go to all those different places to get to all of that stuff, um, including links to the sessions and all of those things. So send me an email at jeff at C5 Insight. I will send you every resource we talked about today and a few others. If you like the idea of the luck principle, you can go grab the book online. Um, wrote a very short, easy to read book that's strategic on that topic. And this is what we do. We would love to engage with you on this as well. If you're in a place where you wanna do better, you wanna get started on the right foot with CRM, or you have a few issues you're struggling with, please reach out and give us a call. That's what we're all about. We love helping with that. Thank you all so much. I'm gonna turn it back over to Lori now.
All right. Thanks so much, Jeff. Great presentation. Okay, questions. We are a couple minutes over. No worries at all, but I'll let you all follow up with your questions directly to Jeff. Otherwise, if you need help getting in touch, you can reach out to me as well. But definitely want to thank you for being here today. As we wrap up, you'll receive a brief survey from the GoToWebinar tool. Appreciate you taking a couple moments to give Jeff some feedback, give us some feedback. Um, comment section if there's anything that you'd like to be seen during this time please let me know. We have a plethora of great presenters at our fingertips that we can reach out to to help get something planned. So let us know um, how we can help you. Uh, just a couple comments here quick, Jeff. Great, great, great webinar. Amazing webinar. Thanks a lot, Jeff. So you're getting great feedback already. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. All right. We'll look forward to seeing you all back here shortly in this virtual environment. Uh, have a great day and stay safe. Thanks all. Thanks. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you, Laurie.